It began as a peaceful Sunday morning with clear skies over Hawaii. There was no reason to believe that December 7th would be any different from any other Sunday uh, on the beach, but yet it became one of the most important and memorable dates in American history. But the peaceful tranquility of this Sunday morning would soon give way to a devastating attack from warplanes from the Empire of, Jap of Japan. In just over an hour, the Japanese destroyed or damaged more than a dozen ships, 180 aircraft, and killed more than 2,400 U.S. service members and civilians. The first Japanese dive bomber appeared over Pearl Harbor at 7.55 a.m. local time on December 7th, 1941. Over the next half hour, Pearl Harbor's airfields and docked ships were subjected to a merciless assault with bombs, bomb, bombs guns, and torpedoes, and then a second wave struck about 8.50 a.m., and the Japanese withdrew shortly after 9 a.m. The entire attack on Pearl Harbor lasted just over an hour. The following day, most of us can remember what the speech that was given by Franklin Roosevelt. He said, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, is a date that will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. What you might not know is that on the following day, the Japanese air forces continued to attack in the Philippines because their goal was to take over the entire Pacific as part of their uh, empire. And so within hours, they began attacking the Philippines starting in Manila. So President Roosevelt asked for a unanimous declaration of war with Japan, and at 4.10 p.m. Eastern Time on December the 8th, Congress granted his request with only one dissenting vote. Three days later, on, September the, on December the 11th, Germany declared war on the United States, drawing <clears throat> America into a world war that would continue for another three years and nine months. That casualty count for America would include more than 400,000 dead, 670,000 wounded, 72,000 missing. The Warrior Series is about spiritual warfare, but it engages uh, stories from World War II. And some of the more compelling ones um, we've actually uh, demonstrated in, in other chapters of the series. And coming out of the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, <clears throat> there is the story of Mitsuo Fushida. He was the commander of the raid on Pearl Harbor. Mitsuo Fushida came into the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, anxious to kill Americans because he hated America. And he had this passionate desire to, to kill Americans. And he, was, he, he talks about it in his book about how delighted he was at the damage he had done and the, and the uh, number of ships he had brought down. What is remarkable about Mitsuo Fushida's life was that after the war, his life was impacted by the life of a man by the name of Jacob DeShazer who had a hatred for Japan. Jacob DeShazer was a bombardier on a plane that went down and he ended up being a prisoner of war for three and a half years. <clears throat> and during that time, he felt the call to, to convert to Christianity and Following that, became a missionary that came back to Japan as a missionary and impacted the life of Mitsuo Fushida. And then there's the story of Peggy Covell. Peggy was a young student in America whose parents were brutally murdered by Japanese soldiers while they were serving as missionaries in Japan and in the Philippines. Peggy's life 
and testimony also affected Mitsuo Fushida. So the Fushida ended up being a missionary himself after the war. This is a story, a dramatic story of the way that God has worked in the lives of all three of these individuals, especially that of Mitsuo Fushida, again, the leader, the leader of the raid on Pearl Harbor that day. As for Pearl Harbor, America was caught by surprise. President Roosevelt and most other Americans wanted to stay out of World War II. It had been going on for two years, and even with the invasion, German invasion of Poland on September the 1st, 1939, we still managed to stay out of the war. But as you look back on history, you realize there were a lot of warning signs that should have, could have, put America on notice that they would have a destiny in Pearl Harbor. If you look back on history, if you look back on history, what you see is that beginning with the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, you had several events that happened. Adolf Hitler joined the Nazi party in 1919. He was sent to prison in 1924 where he wrote Mein Kampf. Uh, in 1925, um, April of 1925, the, the German Schutzstaffel, the SS, was formed. And that would be later used by Hitler to do some of his most egregious acts. In 1933, January, President von Hindenburg appointed Adolf Hitler to the position of Chancellor. In March of 1933, the first concentration camp was opened at Dachau. And then at August the 2nd of 1934, upon the death of President von Hindenburg, Hitler proclaimed himself to be supreme, to be the Fuhrer. So you see the rise to power of a man who was imprisoned early in his career, and yet came out of prison and rose to power and rose to be one of the most evil men in all of recorded history. On February the 26th of 1935, Hitler reestablished the German army in, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. In the August of 1935, President Roosevelt signed the uh, Neutrality Act, keeping America out of the war, declaiming our neutrality to stay out of the war. Just 15 days later, Hitler passed the Nuremberg Race Laws, which alienated Jews from the uh, rest of German society. And then in March of th 1936, Hitler invaded the Rhineland to recapture land that he felt they rightfully owned out of World War I. And yet, even though this was a violation of the Treaty of Versailles, there was still no response from Britain or France. So while the war in Europe was heating up, the Japanese were making their presence known in Pacific. It, it was pretty evident what Jap what was going on with Japan. In 1932, they had the invasion of Manchuria. And in 1937, they started attacking China and other Southeast Asian countries. In 1937, December, we had the rape of Nan Nanking, uh, which was a bloody a bloodbath in the city of Nanking, China, uh, leading up to the appointment of Hideki Tojo, in July of 1940 as Minister of War. Tojo would later go on to do some of the most egregious and evil things imaginable, especially with respect to uh, Japanese prisoners of war. In Germany, 1938 was the year that Austria uh, was annexed by Hitler. September of 1938, the British with, uh, went with uh, Lord Ch uh, Neville Chamberlain, I'm sorry, uh, negotiated the agreement at Munich that would set peace for all time and gave Germany, gave uh, Hitler what he had asked for. 
and they assumed that this appeasement would set would uh, set the stage for future peace because there's no way that Hitler would have violated that. In November of 1938, we had what is known as the Night of Glass, the Night of Crystal. It's called Kristallnacht, where the Holocaust went from alienation and ostracization to outright cruel persecution, death, bloodshed, the destruction of businesses and synagogues and hospitals. That was the night that the Holocaust went into full force in the most serious and egregious way possible. Then you look back over the timeline in 1939 and 1940, the things that were happening there, uh, opportunities for the United States to see this and know that they were going to eventually be drawn into the war. September the 1st, the Nazis of 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and Britain, France, Austria, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand all declared war on Germany, but America stayed on the sidelines. And in 1940, they invaded Denmark, Norway, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands. And then in 1940, Winston Churchill was elected British Prime Minister. And in the summer of 1940, the bloody battle of Britain began, where the German planes were doing air raids throughout Britain and throughout London. Uh, the battles over London were involved... Uh, quite a few civilian deaths, but America continued to stay out of the war. President Roosevelt provided non-military support to Britain in 1940 with what was called the Destroyers for Bases Agreement and the Lend-Lease Act. Yet there were incidences that could have triggered the war. In uh, Iceland, there was an incident between USS Niblick and, the, and a German U-boat. In September, a German U-boat fired on the US, uh, USS Greer, which is a destroyer. And in September the 6, 1941, German air aircraft sank a U.S. merchant ship in the Red Sea, and the SS Sessa was torpedoed. So on September the 11th, 1941, President Roosevelt issued a warning to Hitler and Mussolini. He said, stop it. Less than a month later, the USS Reuben James was sunk and the USS Kearney was torpedoed. And still, America remained neutral. In the years leading up to Pearl Harbor, America worked diligently to stay out of the war. But on December 7, 1941, the Japanese Empire delivered a sudden and violent surprise invitation to join the war. America was caught by surprise. But why? They had a lot of evidence leading up to that time to get prepared for the war. As a Christian, we look at this as a lesson and say, are we prepared? Are we prepared for what, is hap what happens when we become a Christian? According to, to Scripture, all, future, all true followers of Jesus Christ are engaged in a daily spiritual war. This is all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament of the Bible. Our enemies are Satan, his demonic hosts, the world's culture, and our own flesh. It is mind-numbing to see how many Christians don't realize that from the moment of our conversion, Satan and the world's culture have designs on us. Far too many Christians have, have lived in the belief that Christianity is a life of peace, prosperity, health, and wealth, that God's going to just make your life just so wonderful. When you look at the disciples, 
the apostles, 11 of the 12 apostles, were executed. They didn't live a life of peace and prosperity. The one that was not executed was boiled in oil. That was Paul, I mean, uh, John, on the Isle of Patmos. Um, it's, it was far from a life of peace and prosperity. From the moment of your conversion, Satan has his sights set on you. And the world culture is not your friend. The world culture, Satan, is demonic forces. And the third enemy, your own flesh, have already left the carrier on the way to meet you on a peaceful Sunday morning in Hawaii. It's not a time to set up camp on the beach. It's time to prepare for the battle. For followers of Jesus Christ, neutrality is not an option. We can wait for an invitation by the enemy and he will show up. Or we can prepare for the battles that lie ahead. The battles that scripture has told us about. The battles that, that we know are, are going to be part of our lifestyle. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 12 verses 49 to 53. He said, I came to cast fire on the earth and I would that it were already kindled. I have, been, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No. I tell you, but rather division. And then he goes on to talk about the division. Jesus came to conquer Satan Jesus came to destroy Satan's work and he came to deliver us, to provide a deliverance from us from a world that is consumed with Satan's cause. Dr. R.C. Sproul of Ligonier Ministries put it this way. He said, unless we know the enemy we face and how to defeat him, our efforts to live out the gospel are for naught. Scripture lists our main enemies as the world, the flesh, and the devil, all of him whom are formidable indeed. However, to fight any of these is to fight the enemy himself. You see, the world, the flesh, and demonic forces are all under the orchestration of Satan himself. The world is deceived. The world wants to influence the way you live your life. The world wants to influence the way you see others. And so Satan is able to use the world and he's able to use your fleshly, your sinful flesh against you. So it is three enemies all fighting under the direction of Satan himself. C.S. Lewis talked about Satan and demons and the way the world looks at Satan and the demons. And even most Christians do this as well. In the screw tape letters in the introduction, C.S. Lewis said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. Two equal and opposite errors. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Satan is equally pleased with both. You've got people on one side that say that Satan is not a real being, but he is a symbol of evil. He's a metaphor. Um, and Satan is good with you dismissing him to that level. But demons are real. Satan is real. He's a fallen angel. On the other hand, you have people here who obsess over Satan. They find him behind and rebuke him for every affliction in life. You lose your car keys and you yell at the devil. I, I command you, Satan, to be gone from me. And they, they engage in this obsession with Satan. Um, the reality is that Satan is real. Satan is powerful. But he's in subjection to a sovereign God. He is powerful. And we should not take him for granted. He is seductive. 
Satan is a real being, but we live in our life, we don't focus on Satan. We don't obsess over Satan, but we don't dismiss him. For centuries, false teachers have poisoned the church, and they will continue to do so. It says so in Scripture. They present a diminished image of God and Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity and who sits at the right hand of the Father. He was not just a human prophet or a great teacher. He is and forever will be the great I Am. Teachers have denied the existence of Satan. They've denied the existence of hell. And they minimize or deny the existence of sin. We have witnessed the perversions of the reality of Christ and the attributes of God. We have to stay focused on our attention is not going to be on Satan. Our attention is going to be on our relationship and our right view of God and Christ. My pastor, many years ago, I went to him, um, Harry Reader, and I felt the weight of spiritual war going on in my life, and I really was struggling with it. <clears throat> and so I met with him and talked to him about it, and he gave me an answer that he repeated from his pulpit many times on Sunday mornings. He said, spiritual warfare is not an exotic subset of the Christian life. So when I mentioned spiritual warfare, he said it's not unusual. It's not an exotic, it's the, we're not talking about heads turning on uh, around on their, on their shoulders and spitting up pea soup and uh, those kinds of things that we see in the movies. He's talking about the way that Satan usually attacks us. It is not an exotic subset of the Christian life, but he said it is the Christian life. Discipleship is about discipline. It's about staying in the Word, and it's about focusing our attention on Christ. And it's a daily battle because every morning we get up, the world is going to attack. Satan is going to be involved, and the flesh is also going to be our opponent. One of my favorite books is a book by Thomas Brooks. It's called Precious Remedies Against Satan Device, Satan's Devices. <clears throat> he said, Beloved and our dearest Lord, Christ the Scripture, your own heart, and Satan's devices are the four primary things, prime things that should be first and studied most and searched. It is my work as a Christian and more as a watchman, to do my best to discover the fullness of Christ, the emptiness of the creature, and the snares of the great deceiver. I want to point something out here with respect to what Thomas Brooks said. He doesn't talk about us fighting Satan. He talks about Satan's devices. And he says the way that we battle that is not against Satan himself, but the first thing is to discover the fullness of Christ. If our eyes are focused on Christ, if he's preeminent in our life, then our defense is on solid ground. He follows it up by saying the scripture, because the scripture is the revealed word of Christ, the revealed word of God. And that gives us the ammunition to live our lives in the way that he's called us to live. But sadly, so many people are so ignorant of Scripture. We've reached the point in our society where people are looking for a verse of the day instead of studying the rich, richness of Scripture. To know Christ, you have to know his word. The third thing he says is your own hearts. And there he says the emptiness of the creature, the emptiness of you and I. We were born with a sin nature, and our sin nature gets in the way all the time. It's always searching for an opportunity to take precedence in our life and to take the place of the rightful place of Christ in our life. And so he says, study your own hearts and don't trust the man in the mirror. 
But then he talks about Satan's devices and Satan's snares. He doesn't talk about Satan himself. He talks about understanding the ways that Satan will attack, the ways that Satan will trip us up. He is looking for the things that Satan uses in our life every day in order to take us off message. Jesus was speaking to the elders and the religious leaders of his day in Luke 4, 20, 21, when he quoted Isaiah 61. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison to those who are bound. When he finished speaking, he rolled up the scroll and, and looked at these religious leaders and shocked them by saying, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to earth on a mission. And yes, his mission included taking care of the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. But he also spoke of setting the captives free and opening the prison doors. What was he talking about when he talked about liberty to the captives? So who are the captives? Who are those that are bound in prison? The people who have believed the lives of Satan and his messengers and the false teachers because without the gospel they face eternity in a place of torment that Jesus described many times in his ministry. This is the part that our modern culture wants to leave out. Sin is real. Hell is real. And Jesus talked about it a lot. He has come to set us free and the gospel is what sets us free. Many will say we're living in a New Testament world. But look at what Ma uh, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17. He said, I have not come, into, come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, who relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches those to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Think about the teachers today who dismiss the Old Testament and read that second paragraph. Whoever teaches, whoever relaxes the messages of the Old Testament will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but it's not popular. People have decided to discard the Old Testament. The Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit, spoken through the writers of our Bible, and there are 66 books, not just the uh, 27 books of the New Testament, but also the 39 books of the Old. It's complete, and everything in it is important. Jesus confirmed and illuminated the Ten Commandments. He didn't dismiss them. He didn't even minimize them. But Jesus offered forgiveness for our sins. He called for repentance, but he never dismissed or ignored the sins. A big part of his mission was to free us from the bondage, penalty of sin. Satan came in this world. He brought death. He brought sin. And Jesus' mission on earth was to, to deliver us from that eternal death. He did not come to usher in a life of ease and prosperity. In John, 1 John 3, he said, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. By this it is evident who are... Those who are children of God and who are children of the devil, who do, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So this brotherly love message that is very popular today is great. But he also talks about righteousness, and that is important. 
And then concerning the world culture, he talked, we, we want to be friends with the world. We want the world to love us. We want the love to the world to accept us. And we want to live in this artificial peace and prosperity time. But Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Think about that for a minute. If the world culture is looking at you and, and embracing you and welcoming you there, you got to stop and ask yourself, whose side am I on? The fact that you are a true follower of Christ should make the culture uh, hate you. It should offend the culture. The message of the cross is offensive. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son, but the world rejected him. The offer of eternal life is for those who place their faith and trust in Jesus and realize that the cross is where those sins were paid for and the cross itself gives us that passage to live eternal life with Jesus. The world is rejected, and we shouldn't be surprised when the world hates us. Regarding the flesh, the Apostle Paul said it best in Romans 7. He said, I find in the principle that is evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in the inner person, but I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. Paul had to struggle inside of him. He wanted to do right. He wanted to live a righteous life, but sin through the flesh was continually warring against him. So his statement in verse 24 is, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Of course, the answer comes later in the chapter 7 and in chapter 8. Praise be to God, who is the one who is going to deliver. But we are born with a sin nature. And the only remedy is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. The flesh is deadly because we trust it. We look in the mirror and we see somebody we like. We make light of our sins. We explain them away. We justify them instead of looking at it the way that Jesus said it. He said, if your right hand offends, cut it off. We should be looking at the flesh not as our friend, but as one of our spiritual enemies. The spiritual warfare is the life of a true follower of Christ. Jesus did call us to love our brother. He called us to forsake False religions, he warned us of the reality of hell. He called us to a lifestyle of repentance, obedience, and faith. Any church that teaches a watered-down gospel, they're not messengers of love. They're not bringing the gospel. They're bringing something that everybody wants to hear instead of the full truth that they need to hear. So we are in spiritual warfare. America was not prepared for the outbreak of World War II. We ignored or dismissed many of the warning signs until the enemy showed up on our doorstep. But Scripture makes it abundantly clear all the way through Scripture that Christian life is not a day on the beach. It's a daily battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Jesus didn't say, grab a Mai Tai and meet me at the beach. He said, if anyone follows, wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up a cross. The life of a Christian is a life of spiritual warfare. So we have the outcome of every conflict in human history was um, uncertain, including World War II. But the outcome of spiritual warfare is not in question. Satan declared war on God 
and on the followers of Christ in the Garden of Eden. Christ secured the victory on Calvary's cross. We are not fighting spiritual warfare. We are not fighting Satan, who is the author of spiritual warfare. We are fighting an enemy that is already defeated. Until then, until, until Christ returns, we're going to continue to have those battles. It is going to be the life that we live. It is going to be the life we live as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. We've been called to that lifestyle. So keep this in mind. Remember, Pearl Harbor came as a surprise to America. But spiritual battles with the world, the flesh, and the devil need not come as a surprise. We stay rooted in the Word. We stay focused on Christ. Christ, Christ, and Christ alone is the centerpiece of our life, and we know about Him through His Word. Thank you.